Hi all, welcome to our webinar. We're just waiting for all the delegates to kind of join us. We've got a few registrations today for our State of Six webinar. So hang on. Okay, I think we can get going. Good morning all to you that have joined us today for our webinar with our partner and Today our speakers Charlie West and Paul Smith will be highlighting our key findings of the soon to be published State of Six Market Report, which showcases six leaders in different verticals and how they become leaders. My name is Diana Tuskiewicz, I'm going to be your host for today. And before we start, a bit of housekeeping. We have left some time at the end of to answer any questions you may have, just simply drop them in the Q&A or the chat window. Also, this webinar will be recorded and shared with you the next day as well. So just listen in and you can take notes. Now I would like to introduce our speakers and creators of this report. Uh, with me today, I have Charlie West, Senior Insight Specialist at the moment, and Paul Smith, Global Marketing Director at NPSX. Charlie has over 10 years experience in customer experience and is passionate about bringing the voice of the customer into the heart of the business. She calls herself an inside speak and enjoying interrogating data for the stories at Kenton. Before joining in Moment, she headed up the Global CX program at Dyson. Our co-author Paul is a highly experienced marketing professional specializing in brand and customer experience implementation with a successful background in customer experience and marketing. Paul has proven a track record of building great brands and implementing the Net Promoter System to drive customer experience transformation. Before joining NPSX in 2022, Paul was Director of Customer Insights at NetBest Bank, where he was responsible for bringing the voice of real customers into the boardroom and driving customer change across all the brands. Today, they will be taking you through the background of the study, the six leaders per vertical, and what changes we have seen in 2019 before diving into the key drivers that help drive customer loyalty. They will discuss how this differs by industry and why innovation is key before taking you through the recommendations on how you yourself can improve your NPS to deliver ROI. And with that, Charlie, I hand off to you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, great to be able to share the findings of this report with you today. Um, so the study took place in the first quarter of this year using a panel um, who were invited to take the survey um, purposefully na nationally representative in terms of location, age and gender um, in order to get a good um, number of res responses across industries and brands. Each respondent was asked about five industries, but then only two more in detail on a least fill basis. They were then asked up to three brands per industry. NPS was chosen as the benchmark metric, as it's a commonly accepted and industry standard measure of customer loyalty and engagement. And the question used was, how likely are you to recommend brand X to friends or family? In addition, we asked more detailed questions around product holdings for telco, financial services and insurance, as the different brands within these sectors have very different product offering, and which may influence their proposition and the experience their customers have. For instance, some insurance offer um, only health insurance, whereas others offer a full range of products across car, home and life. So on the next slide, um, we can look at the MPS scores across all of the 199 brands included in the survey. Um, at a brand level, the average NPS is plus 13. Um, and compared to 2019, um, across a similar range of industries, the, the leader's score has dropped. 2019, the leading brand had an MPS of plus 70, um, as opposed to Volvo, who led this study at plus 55. However, the average MPS score has increased slightly from plus 10 in, in 2019. Luxury automotive brands hold most of the top spots, um, with Volvo leading the way. Um, Volvo's actually up six points since 2019. 
Retailers and grocers also have several brands in the top 20. Midpack are brands who might not stand out from their competitors as much and might not be either a leader or a laggard in their own industry. These include many high street brand names such as Starbucks, Vodafone, Fiat, Sainsbury's and H&M. Laggard brands are a high concentration of energy suppliers, water services and financial services. Basically, those industries most impacting respondents' cost of living. On the next slide, we're going to look at the average NPS across industries. At an industry level, the NPS is plus 12. The top end of this is automotive, retail and hotels. And this might be because consumers have more choice here and it's more likely to be a discretionary, perhaps, or a luxury spend. With automotive and retail um, industries, respondents place the highest, the highest scores for product quality, innovation and value. Within the middle of the pack are the moderate performers, restaurants, media, financial services and insurance. I'm um, standing out amongst those are cafes and restaurants who rank second in terms of great product quality and insurance who ranks top for making it easy for customers to get the help when they need it. At the bottom end, again, are the utility companies where consumers have less choice in a provider that they use. And it might be seen as more of a necessity um, and particularly with some of the large price increases we've seen this year. It's unsurprisingly that they're at the bottom. They also had very low scores around quality, innovation, um, and being socially and environmentally responsible. In fact, a lot of the, the respondents um, in the survey talked about environmental issues being top of mind, um, but also customer service levels being important. Um, electricity and gas, there was a lot of negative um, feedback around the cost of living crisis. Um, and again, quality of customer service was very important. Um, social media was a little bit different. Um, was feedback around the quality of the apps that were provided, but also the toxic and addictive environment that social media can create. On the next slide, we're going to look at NPS segments, so the percentage of promoters, um, passives and detractors within each industry. Unsurprisingly, automotive stands out with a much higher percentage of promoters and likewise utility providers at the other end of the spectrum. However, in interestingly, financial services has very much um, has, has fewer passives than some of the other industries in this middle section, with consumers having much more polarized views and relatively higher numbers of promoters and detractors. Other more middling industries such as hotels, insurance, um, marketplace and cafe restaurants have much more passives, with consumers having an OK, but not great experience. These industries have the potential to switch some of those passives to promoters by offering more wow or different experiences that really delight their customers. So who are the leaders in each categories? Moving on to the next slide, please, Dave. Thank you very much. Um, a couple of brands to mention. Um, and actually, I think it's a really interesting mix of, um, of companies here offering very different uh, propositions to the market. Um, but some of them um, are really focusing on that unique product and customer experience. NFU, for instance, are a leading brand. They've won multiple awards um, with their focus on customers, and they actually have a charter to make a positive improvement to their members in rural communities and to the environment. Nando's focus on a very specific type of food spiced with their signature Piri Piri seasoning. They offer a relaxed atmosphere. They have a reward scheme um, and unlimited drinks when you're in the restaurant. Whereas Starling Bank um, are very much a mobile first bank, focusing on digital innovation through their app, giving um, transparency and um, proactive communications. Um, they want to be responsive and really empower their customers to take better control of their finances. So a really great mix there, very interesting to look at. On the next slide, we're gonna have a look at the range of those NPS scores across different industries. Um, interestingly, there's over a hundred point difference between the leader and the Lagarde. Um, at the top of this graph, um, we've got those industries where we've got those broader range, um, such as um, social media, um, electricity and gas, um, you know, and, and that really shows that there are very different different experiences across those different brands. Um, and it can be influenced by the different propositions each of those different brands offer. 
Um, an example um, of one of the leaders here would be Aldi. You know, they've had to be a very fast growing brand. They have a very specific, very low cost budget proposition to customers. And they really stand out from traditional grocers such as Sainsbury's or Asda. Likewise, Tesco, Tesco Mobile um, leads the telco industries and they've won multiple awards for their customer service. Um, media is also an interesting category. Um, Spotify are mentioned as having a large range of content and choice, um, while Apple is mentioned as being expensive and focused on a very targeted segment of consumers who have Apple devices. And then at the bottom, we have got insurance and cafes and restaurants, where they're providing a much more consistent experience and hence, hence a much smaller range of scores. Now we're going to go into a little bit more detail um, and have a look at some examples um, of, um, well, we're going to look at the change. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Paul. Paul, over to you. Thanks, Charlie. So uh, hi, everyone. Um, as, as was mentioned at the start, we have got the ability in this study um, to look at what has happened since 2019. So what this chart shows is essentially the change in performance of exactly the same cohorts of brands um, by industry. So, um, you know, what the brands that we looked at in 2019, how have they fared in 2023? And I think this makes uh, for fascinating uh, reading. And if you are an insight geek like Charlie, then you'll definitely love the longitudinal nature of this, of this data. So right slap back in the mid slap bang in the middle, you can see the the crisis that the energy companies are experiencing. Um, it's not really a surprise um, when you when you kind of read the headlines. Anyone that has, um, I guess, had to pay an energy bill will know the challenge that that industry has um, been facing, or the consumers of the the brands in that industry have been facing. I think what is interesting there, and we see it in the verbatim, is that customers are seeing those industries or those brands, sorry, you know, post record profits in some cases, but also then increase the cost of energy. So at a very simplistic level, um, it doesn't look like the brands are necessarily, you know, of the category at least is walking the talk uh, about being customer focused. So that's an interesting area, and we'll kind of deep dive on that shortly. Um, other couple of, of interesting areas, uh, you know, I, I used to work in the financial services industry at NatWest, as Diana talked about, and um, banking is fascinating to me, always will be I'm a banking geek as well as an insight geek. And um, what we've seen here is that actually the, what I would call the traditional incumbents, uh, or sorry, the traditional, uh, I guess, um, startups, the likes of First Direct, Metro, you know, the, the people that push the boundaries versus the traditional banks in a, say, first wave. And we've seen some of the shine come off of those brands. And so they were way out in front in 2019. They've really dropped back into the pack. And what is now happening is we see the fintechs, the Starlings, the Monzos, really pushing um, the kind of new experience standard inside financial services. So um, what, what is also interesting when you peel back the layers in that industry is that actually the traditional banks, your high street banks, are actually making strides forward in, in, in most cases. So it's an interesting mix of the first wave of innovators in banking now having some shine come off, the laggards, the traditional high street banks catching up, and then the fintechs setting the new standard. So that's a sort of decline side of the house. On the upside, you can see there retail is the biggest um, alongside airlines. Airlines is really a, about the bounce back from COVID. And obviously 2019 study didn't take that into account. It was, at, you know, it was way before, way before, I mean, six months before I think any, anyone had heard of COVID. Um, but you can definitely see this sort of return to exploring the world, enjoying, I guess, leisure time, um, it being you know, benefiting the airline industry. And similarly in retail, what we're seeing there is the kind of, uh, I guess, fast fashion um, brands really taking strides um, to improve um, the experience that they deliver, you know, linked to the fact that, you know, it's technically a slightly sunnier outlook than, than when we were when we we're looking back in 2019. So some interesting shifts there across the different categories. Um, what we're going to 
have a look at now is the um, the drivers of MPS. So obviously we can start to look at what is behind that performance. And um, the first thing I would say on, on this uh, piece of data is that these are all relative. So whilst you can see top right, the kind of main driver, if you like, or most important driver is product quality, it does not mean that helping customers through financial financially difficult times is not a driver at all. This is just showing the relative, uh, I guess, ranking of them. Um, and so you can see great product quality, great value, no surprise really in a time of, I guess, economic turbulence. People are looking to cut their cloth accordingly. They're looking to make sure that their, the individual pounds in their pocket go further. So that combination of quality and value is super important. And we see that coming here. Um, but interestingly, uh, linked again, probably to the times we're living in, is that makes it making it easy to get help is the third, I guess, relative, uh, relatively important driver, followed by innovation. So people are not just looking for same old, same old. And when they are in trouble, they are looking for help. Um, and they actually are still intrigued and engaged by brands that start to deliver on an innovation agenda. So these, these drivers help us understand how the brands are performing. And we'll do a couple of case studies and you'll see some of the, the detail in that in, in the report. So but the main thing here is to remember these are all relative. So it doesn't mean that the bottom left is unimportant. It just means it's less uh, important uh, you know, versus the top, the top right. So moving on to the next uh, couple of slides, we're just having a look at, at the industries in aggregate here, because I think there's some interesting category dynamics that play. Um, and if you are in an industry that is traditionally what I would call a laggard industry, when you start to peel back what's happening inside that industry and look at the brands, you can see that it is very possible to achieve greatness, even within an industry that has traditionally struggled and, you know, you saw energy at the bottom right. There is an amazing performance by one of the energy brands, um, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, but just looking at these drivers by, by industry leader, you can see on the right hand side here, we have the, the categories or the industries that lead, um, that have the best, I guess, um, you know, driver performance. Um, so grocers, automotive, insurance, and retail, very similar to the, to the industries, obviously, that are top of the tree. So you can see that. One of the biggest gaps and, and the most interesting piece of data is that, for me at least, is the gap in great value. So regardless of whether retail are leading that, the leading brand in, in retail is the furthest away from in, of any of the other brands, um, you know, in the value and the value driver having the 21 point gap. Um, and you'll see there that the leading industry is being really driven by its outstanding product quality uh, automotive. And again, we'll, we'll come on to talk about automotive shortly, but there is a, I almost think a, an inbuilt category reinvention that happens, uh, or at least model reinvention that happens inside automotive, you know, every two, three, four years, I don't know the cycles exactly, you do have the new golf, the new update of the new golf. And so there is this built in, I guess, innovation cycle that consumers and customers see quite readily in that industry. Um, and that's definitely coming through um, as they see, you know, strong product quality associated with that. So that's the overall industry view. One of, one of the industries that we thought was quite interesting, uh, which we'll have a look at on the next slide, is the hotel sector. So post COVID has been uh, you know, as everyone saw, a kind of rebound, and we're maybe we're maybe at the top of that bound, or even on the on the downswing of it. But hotels have performed really well, and I think what they have done is is have that combination of value and quality. And each brand in the top three, so we've got Hilton, Premier Inn, and Airbnb, a hotel of sorts or a hotel uh, equivalent of sorts, each have a different approach to that marriage of great product quality and great value. Um, now, that's true across the category, value and quality. What's also important in uh, hotels, especially uh, the more traditional ones, is the, the quality of service you get when you're there. Um, you know, I think the 
the choice of your bedroom, the choice of your pillows, that's all very, very personal. And when you go to a hotel, you really have no choice in any of that. So, you know, customers, I guess, discount the ability to get the phenomenal a night's sleep that they may have got at home, but they don't discount the fact that people can help them enjoy that experience nonetheless. Um, you know, so we see the quote here, a comfy bed in a room is all you get, but often that's enough. Um, we see as well that, you know, when people are challenged, they, they seek quality, or they seek the employees and they seek help. And um, so it's very interesting, uh, I guess, differential there between these three brands, but they're all focusing on value and quality in their own specific way. So that's that's the uh, kind of industry view of the world. We then took a very similar view about the brands, um, and you've seen the top you've seen the top brands by by industry there. Um, but if we move on to the next slide, you can start to see, um, I guess, uh, the groupings. Um, so we've got you know the the usual suspects to some degree on the right hand side of this chart with um, categories um, where the leaders or the top brands are over 40 uh, in, on NPS. Now, the score is less important here. This, this is sort of the, the breadth and the shape of, of the, the differential is the, uh, the most important thing. Um, and what you'll see quite often on the, on the right-hand side here is these brands tend to be, and not always, but tend to be growing faster, gaining more market share. Aldi is a great example of that. Uh, Starling, obviously, putting on customers at quite a clip. Um, growing their app and growing their organization fairly well. So we can see that these brands are the brands that are often in the news, uh, often making waves, often innovating and delivering great experiences. We do actually have a category to the left of this chart, which we'll, we will explore as part of our report. Um, and these are the industries where no one, no one brand gets over 30. Um, and what is interesting when you look at that um, is that there is in each case a very, very strong leader. Um, even although the industry itself may have a low average, the leader um, leads by, by, a, by, a good, by a good way. And one example I would call out there is Octopus Energy. So Octopus Energy are the only energy brand with a positive NPS in energy. Um, their NPS is 39 points higher than the average NPS for that category. So the reason to draw attention to that is, you know, what are the learnings from Octopus that you can apply in your own business if you are inside an energy company? Or if you're not, if you're also in an equally challenged industry, you know, maybe less, I guess, less touch point industry like insurance, you can see that there are brands in similar industries with similar challenges that are managing to stand out. So Part of our report will cover the tips, tips and tricks that you can pick up cross industry because quite often we find um, with clients they tend to look quite rigorously at their own industry but less uh, take less inspiration from from outside the industry. So uh, lots lots more to come on that in the report. In terms of the brand leaders, if we go on to the next slide, please, Diana. Um, we've got here a very similar view on. Uh, who's leading where. Um, and the kind of main point I would make on this, um, and again, focus here on the right-hand side, you've got the brand leaders in each category um, in a sort of, the, of course, the be there type um, place. So Aldi, very well known for delivering great value. Um, that comes through in the fact that it leads on great value. Um, similarly, right now, Aldi wins effectively for helping customers through challenging times because they're getting great quality um, at a, a, a great value uh, price. Um, John Lewis, it's all about the people. So the fact that it's a partnership and the fact that there's been noise, if you like, about that in, in the industry is very interesting. It's reflect the, the strength of feeling uh, when it was discussed that maybe the partnership days are, are kind of Coming to an end, that was quite an interesting reaction. We see that same reaction and reason to vote or to buy at John Lewis, really all about the, the people. Interestingly, automotive only feature one brand in the top uh, here, despite having three or four, um, you know, having leadership in three or four categories. So there's definitely a hint industry halo effect. 
um, but Tesla take the crown in environmental and social responsibility. And really the sum here is these brands are very well known for these things. What they're, what they're consistently doing is taking their brand promise and delivering it through their customer experience. And that I think is a is a big opportunity for lots of brands is to, you know, not only you know talk the talk, but ultimately walk the talk as well and deliver that brand experience day in day out as the as consumers navigate their their organisations. So one thing that we looked at in twenty nineteen and, and we are looking at again this time is the role of innovation because it's quite a, a relatively. Uh, I guess, dynamic thing to look at. And, and uh, we wanted to see whether it's still an important driver. So Charlie, you're going to take us through that, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I love what you just said, actually, about the brand promise um, and then delivering on that through a customer experience, because I think having looked at the detail um, of several brands, it's not always the same thing. You know, it's find what you want to do and keep delivering it and, and look at your customer's experience and how you really want to excel at that. So um, talking of which, we're going to start looking at innovation with IKEA. So it's a brand often talked about in terms of their innovative approach. Um, they didn't win the retail industry in terms of NPS for the study. Um, John Lewis was number one, um, but they did stand out from other retails in terms of innovation. Um, and I think this is for a number of reasons. Uh, they have a heritage of doing things differently, of looking and challenging how things are done. They were one of the first um, furniture stores to offer flat pack furniture to the mass market um, with really innovative approaches both to the design of what they were selling and their products and the packaging and all of it at an affordable price. Um, you know, there is what's called the IKEA effect, which is the idea that we value things more if we actively participated in the building or assembling of the product. Um, you know, I know I've done that myself and have had some success and failures. Um, and that actually links to, to a point that we're going to make slightly later on about automotive. Um, IKEA have experimented in augmented reality. Um, they have an app that now allows you to uh, virtually place your furniture, uh, their furniture in your home. Um, but I think the biggest change, and this is partly driven, no doubt, from the pandemic, was they completely transformed their e-commerce experience, um, which was quite limited before 2019. Um, and anybody who's looked on the IKEA website and done anything like click and collect um, can see it's great. Um, and IKEA is a great example of a brand. They're almost created for these times. They're innovating around affordability and they're also innovating around sustainability, um, which we've come through, which has come through in several brands very specifically. Um, moving on to the next slide and having a quick look at a case study for automotive. Um, the automotive industry led in four out of the eight drivers. Um, on one side, you had the quality of the employees and it being a great place to work. And on the other side, the flip side that, that Paul was talking about earlier, it's around the product and innovation. Um, and our collective experts across our teams um, have created six areas of importance, which are kind of like might be worth considering. Um, and transferable to your industry. So it's that ability um, to take a part or take a, a part in the, the design of your product. And in this part, your car, you know, whether you want to have a different colored bumper or you do want to have different features and functionality within it, you can choose it and have that choice. Um, you know, they're, um, automotive industries are looking at more digital solutions. So perhaps virtual as well as on-site showrooms. Um, in fact, there's an increased usage of digital technologies throughout that customer journey, um, with many of them now having mobile apps um, and becoming much more focused on um, ongoing communication um, with the customer. Subscription models are gaining traction as an, an alternative to the more traditional leasing or ownership. Um, BMW subscription model took a bit of heat um, but again, it offering customers the flexibility to suit their needs. And I think as consumers were getting more used to paying for subscriptions um, on their phone, you know, things like um, meditation apps or yoga apps, exercise apps, um, all sorts of um, music apps. So that's an area to definitely investigate. Um, electric vehicles, uh, obviously, there's a big challenge there in terms of different technology and having to develop the infrastructure and technology to support that changed experience, that changed um, how you have to think about things as a driver. Um, and then lastly, kind of enhanced after sales support. So being proactive rather than reactive to um, needs such as remote diagnostics, maintenance reminders, post-purchase, MOT service reminders, um, and brands such as Toyota, Mercedes, and Honda 
perform particularly well in this area. And at that point, I'm going to hand back to Paul to talk a little bit um, more about some of those recommendations. Thank you. So, you know, innovation is, is one route to success. And we see, you know, the, the folks at the top of the tree, if you like, deploying that well. We thought we'd have a look at the, the laggards and, and we haven't singled out brands here. We're, we're talking industry. Obviously, we do have the brand view and very open to sharing that uh, individually, and privately. Um, but on the, if we look at the slide, actually, please, Diana, that we've got the two industries that you saw at the bottom right hand side here, water and electricity and gas uh, or energy. Interestingly, all former monopolies. So there may be a kind of inbuilt perception uh, bias here. Um, but having said that, when you look at the individual industries, there are leading brands there that don't necessarily suffer from that. So it, it's not necessarily a category malaise that sets in. Um, there's a couple of common things between these industries. Um, and, you know, the first one is, is perception of value, um, making sure that, you know, you kind of I guess opportunities to improve the value, and it's difficult in a, an energy crisis and in a what is turning into a water crisis. I think if you read the news, um, you know, but helping customers through that and helping them get help is is a big opportunity to make your mark, um, even if you can't necessarily do much about the prevailing trends, uh, you know, energy going up. Then how you deal with customers in those times is is a big. Uh, piece that, that applies to both of these categories. In terms of the individuals in, in water, and Charlie touched on this, it's really about the end product, the quality, um, and how that quality is delivered. So the ESG agenda playing large in water, so what's the approach to that? Um, and then in electric, electricity and gas and energy, um, it really is about that, that help I think consumers, from what we see, is they understand the energy pricing to some degree. Um, they know necessarily it's not it's somewhat out with the control of the brands, um, and so actually, when when you know the, the the laggards are, I guess, evaluated, what we see is that customers are looking for their help, not necessarily to change the situation, you know, at the macro level. But to change the individual situation, so how how brands in this space can can help their customer is uh, is an important piece. So we'll move shortly to the Q and A, but I just thought I'd sum up um, some of the key points here. So you know we've we've talked about this throughout. Um, you can see the fact that there's differences between industry and brand. Um, certain brands stand for certain things that there's more than one way to, to skin the cat. Um, and we would always argue that the best way to understand that is not necessarily to listen to this kind of a webinar, but to really listen to your customers, really understand what's going on for them, how well you per are perceived by them, how well you deliver an experience. Um, and therefore, you know, you build a size of CX approach that fits you. Um, the second piece is that, as you've seen, there are many ways to execute that, that customer strategy. And I think oftentimes brands look within their category, but actually having inspiration from other categories, similar type of structure um, may give um, you know, some brands a, an inspiration and an edge that they wouldn't necessarily get by looking at their own uh, category performance. Um, and then, you know, always in our view across both organizations, NPSX and InMoment, really what separates the, la the leaders from the laggards are the, is these three things here, culture, capability and execution. How focused is your culture on customer? Have you got aligned processes around the customer? So it's not just a, an aspiration, it's a systematic approach to culture. Um, what is the capability that underpins that? How strong is the ability um, for your entire organization to hear from customers, to listen to what they're saying, to act on that feedback? Um, and then, you know, you may have all of the listening posts in place. You may have the culture in place. But actually, if you're poorly executing it, then uh, you're unfortunately not going to win. So how well cust customer-focused companies execute to listen, learn, and act from what customers are saying is another crucial factor. So we'll pull all of this into the report 
um, and you'll see, uh, I guess, some more detailed performance reviews. But uh, that's what we wanted to highlight for you guys today. I'll hand back to Diana to conduct the Q&A. Great. Right. Thank you very much for the first insights into the report. Really exciting, some surprising findings. With that, the first question, what was the most surprising find in that study in the data? Uh, do you want me to go first? Um, go for it. Go for it. Yeah, I, I think the most surprising thing I, I was the the gap on certain drivers, and especially on value. So for me, I, I mean, I've come from financial services. We've been talking about the cost of living crisis for you know probably eight, 12 months before obviously it happened or is happening. And, you know, so I would have thought lots of brands would also be doing that and working through to deliver great value for their customers. But it appears that that is not the case. And there is still a big gap between the best and the, and the worst, if you like, on that measure. And I think given this times that we're in, that was a really surprising finding for me. Charlie, you might have a different view. No, no, I, I agree. I think that was really good. I think I think actually one thing for me was some of the sustainability part of things, that it was so low in terms of importance, but actually having looked at a lot of the brands in more detail, um, you know, some of the leading brands actually do have a, a quite a good sustainable um, charter, you know, and they're really looking for the environment or they're thinking about sustainable uh, products. Um, and although it didn't come through as massively important in a driver, there was actually quite a subtle undertow. And actually, there were a few comments coming through from people who um, do care about how companies treat their employees, do care about where the product comes through. Um, and it'd be interesting to see. And I hope that it will see that increasing over time. Great. Thank you. And one other question that came in is, like, how did you account for brand perception and the wider ma macro situation influencing these satisfaction scores? especially looking at the energy sector or utilities. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, this the, the macro situation is the same for everyone. It might, you know, it might affect different brands or different industries in, in more acute ways. So we didn't control for that. We, you know, obviously, because that is happening. It's part of, of the experience that, that brands uh, have to influence or develop. Um, and so, yeah, so it, this is a kind of raw from the customer uh, direct view on, on what uh, and how well certain brands are, are are working. You can see the category effect, you know, you can see energy, um, but even within energy, there are, there are stars, there are leaders um, who are bucking the trend. And, and I've talked about Octopus a couple of times. That is the brand that I would be studying if I was, um, you know, well, in fact, I will be studying <laughs> to have a have a look at the the secret of their success. And um, but it does show that you can build a differentiated brand perception inside yeah. a very very challenged um, yeah market you know industry. And I think that's the really interesting piece. And I know it's really obvious, but it really is about you know if you have a value proposition and you're going to market with something very much more specific. Whatever that is, stick to it and make it the best that you can for your customers. Don't think about being broad. Don't always think about your competitors. Um, and as Paul said, don't look at studies like this and worry about the number. Keep working within, within your company to take action, make those changes and keep the focus on the customer in whatever way um, that, that, you, that you can and, and need to do. Right. Thank you. So this is unfortunately all the time we had for. Surprisingly, we all ran again. Uh, thank you for your time for uh, staying on. Just looking at the numbers shows the interest in the study. I said the recording will be shared with you tomorrow as well of this webinar. And as we alluded to, there will be a report and we're going to share this next week. So anyone on this webinar will receive an email with the, web uh, with the report to kind of read the details as well. If there's any more questions, I just dropped in the email address to send it to. It's emea.events at the moment.com. Uh, so if there's any more questions that pop up, like looking at the recording or looking back at this session today, just reach out to us and we're happy to answer any questions individually as well. With that, thank you, Paul and Charlie, for your insights. And thank you all attendees and anyone that joined today and hope to see you soon.
Thanks. Bye. Bye.